What I want to talk about today is application to healthcare programs. Specifically, what I'm going to focus on is radiologic technology, but there may be some commonality between application to a radiology program and application to other allied health or nursing programs. So what we're going to focus on today is the application process, uh, the different types of application, different types of programs, and what to look for in a program. But I'm also going to talk about what you can do to make yourself more attractive and as an applicant and more likely to be successful in the application period. So I'm going to share this PowerPoint. So first thing you want to do is evaluate your options. There are a lot of different opportunities in healthcare. So what I would recommend that you do is spend a little bit of time and look into the different uh, fields that you might be interested in. So there's nursing, there's uh, respiratory care, there's sonography, there's med lab, there's all different types of, of therapy. There's occupational therapy, there's, there's uh, a physical therapy assistant, and of course, radiologic technology. Radiologic technology, if you're not familiar, is the uh, career field that, that deals with making x-rays, creating x-rays for interpretation by a radiologist. A radiologist is an x-ray doctor. A radiologic technologist is the person who provides the image for the doctor to evaluate. So what you want to do is you want to look at all the different um, career fields and possible avenues that you might be interested in pursuing research those fields, evaluate your preferences, uh, interview people that you know who work in fields and in any of those fields and find out what they think about their their own career field. If they had it all to do over again, would they do that same thing or would they do something different? And then I would recommend that you do, once you narrow your search down a little bit, do some job shadowing. And what job shadowing is, is where you uh, spend some time in a hospital following somebody around and watching what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. In, in job shadowing, what I recommend that you do is do multiple days, um, maybe short shifts, maybe four-hour shifts, uh, do as many as you feel comfortable with, uh, remembering that this is, if you select a career field, it may be something that you'll be doing for the next 40 years. So you want to make sure that you, you go in with a little bit of education and a little bit of understanding what they do. So do some job shadowing. You may have to contact the, the hospital's uh, human resources department of volunteer services in order to, to set that up. But do some job shadowing. Once you decide on a career field, research the programs in your area. Uh, most of the these what you call uh, health, the health science career fields are, are what you call workforce programs. And most of your community college or junior colleges will have uh, most of those programs. Some of your senior colleges will too. It's just that they will be bachelor degree programs. So it'll take you a little bit longer to get through it. Um, and that's okay if that's a, the route you decide to go. But if you're looking for a two-year degree, uh, research your com community college. Find out what programs they offer. And um, I'll show you how to, to find some of those here in a bit. Um, understand the different types of programs because even within a, a single career field, there may be multiple types of programs. So research the programs when you're doing your job interview or your job shadowing, interview the people that that you shadow with. Um, if you know anybody that works in those career fields, ask them those questions. Where did they go? Um, what what college did they attend? What's their impression of the school that they attended and what's their impression of, of other schools compared to their own schools? So some of these technologists will work with graduates from different programs and they'll have a feel for what those other programs, the preparedness uh, that, that the other programs bring to the table as well. So research the programs, go to the institution websites and search for academic programs, just to find out what programs are available. You may have to narrow your search a little bit and go to individual schools like nursing and health sciences or allied health or something like that. If you just do academic programs, you're gonna get everything that the college has to offer in a lot of cases. 
So then we're going to talk about program types or uh, your programs can be categorized in a couple of different ways. One is uh, hospital based programs. There are hospital based programs or college based programs. And then there are colleges that are for profit colleges. So most of the colleges that you're going to be most familiar with are going to receive some sort of state funding. So they're public schools, but there are such things as private schools. And those are and, and even within private schools, you may have one of two things, either truly a private school, private college or possibly what we refer to as a proprietary college. And a proprietary college is a college that springs up. I don't want to necessarily make that sound like a bad thing, but it, it uh, they open to suit a specific demand in an area. So they're private colleges, but they're they're targeted towards a specific uh, population um, and career type. So things to consider, regardless of what type of program you're looking at, are the uh, obviously the type of programs. But what is the program length? Uh, sometimes there's a direct correlation between program length and preparedness for the student. If you just select based on the shortest program, then you may graduate and be completely unprepared for the career field that you're about to enter. Uh, what are the clinical hour requirements? So any quality radiography program, or I'm just going to jump out on a limb and say any program that is uh, related to health care is going to require some sort of, of clinical hours. Clinical hours is that's the time that you spend inside of the hospital with the patient. That's truly where you learn to do the job. Uh, where are there clinical sites? Are you going to have to drive to those clinical sites? So they're going to be local to where you live. What does the classroom schedule look like? What, what does the clinical schedule look like? Um, how many hours a day? What is the, the time commitment for both of those things combined? Uh, transferability of classes. You may enter a program thinking that you're never going to pursue higher education past that program, but you may find yourself uh, in a situation where later on you want to maybe go back to school and, and get your bachelor's degree. And if you graduated from a program that does not have transferable classes, you're going to be starting back over at square one. Uh, what are the outcomes for that that uh, program. So the things that you we'll talk about the things that, that you need to assess in selecting a program in that is the program or the college. Is it accredited? And we'll talk about what that means here in a bit. And is it a certificate or a degree program? So some of your certificate programs, uh, I don't want to say they're deceptive, but they may be a limited license and you need to uh, evaluate that on the front end so that you don't get to the, the point of completion of the program and find out that you're not fully licensed. So uh, consider those as well. For-profit institutions or those proprietary schools, uh, the things that you need to ask is just that. Is it a limited practice program? In radiography in the state of Texas, you have three possible licenses. With radiography, you've got uh, two different licenses. You have a state license and a national license. And a national license is fully licensed with the state. For example, uh, the state of Texas calls a fully licensed radiologic technologist a medical radiologic technologist. So that's, so that's an MRT license. But there are two licenses under that that are not fully registered. So a person who, who graduates from a, a fully accredited uh, two-year program, associate's degree program in the state of Texas takes a national license through the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists. But there's also a state license, and that is your MRT license. But the two license, state licenses under that are limited practice license. So if you're looking at a, a for-profit or a proprietary school, you need to find out if it's an associate's degree program that would allow you to take the national license, or is it just a, a uh, training program for a limited license? So also for-profit institutions, since they don't get state funding, they uh, their tuition costs tend, tend to be quite high. So you need to assess that as well. What are the clinical oblig obligations and what clinical sites are utilized? Again, how far do you have to drive? Do they already have clinical sites established? Uh, of, uh, for the state of Texas, I once had to evaluate a, a proprietary school that didn't even have clinical sites set up yet. And they had students that were getting ready to uh, 
enter the, the second phase of, of their education. So those things you need to know. Do they have those clinical sites set up and what are the obligations? And remember, if you if you're working off of a, a or you're attending a, a limited license uh, program, the, the clinical hours probably go, probably going to be quite short. So evaluate that. Um, the shortest program is not always the best. Um, and then ask when you start your clinical education, regardless of what type of program it, it is, if it's hospital based or uh, college based or, or proprietary school, when do you start your clinical education? Uh, sometimes uh, the length of the, the amount of clinical hours is a little bit of a turnoff, but again, that's where you learn how to do the job. So uh, you want a school that, that does ample uh, clinical hours. Obviously, there's there's a limit. There's a point of diminishing returns. If you're entering an associate's degree program that, that requires 4,000 hours of clinical education, that's excessive. But also, if you're entering a program that only does maybe 1,200 hours of education, you might be graduating from that program without being fully uh, prepared for the workforce. So hospital-based programs. Um, the things that you need to ask about a hospital-based program is, is it associated with a college? So if it's associated with college, those, the credit that you earn there should be transferable. Um, if it's not, you know, um, you need to ask that. And you may need to, to not find out that from the, the college or the hospital-based program itself, but maybe from an institution of higher education beyond that. Check with a local university. Do they accept the the um, credits that they earned in this hospital-based program. What are the clinical obligations? So hospital-based programs tend to, to do a lot of clinical hours, which might sound good, but um, sometimes those clinical hours may be uh, much higher than any other program. So are you willing to spend that much time in, in clinical education? So you need to be aware that clinical education is time that you spend with the patient working in the hospital, but you don't get compensated for that time. So it's a lot of time that you spend. Uh, what is the success rate on the credentialing exam? Again, the ARRT exam, what is the success rate on that? How many people pass it versus how many people fail it? What are the costs? One of the big benefits to a hospital-based program is that because you do so many clinical hours, uh, the, the cost may be quite low. Also, some of those hospital-based programs might be willing to allow you to um, attend at lower cost if you sign a contract to work for them after graduation. So again, are there any travel requirements and are there any contract requirements after graduation would be other things that you would want to consider. So college-based programs are most common. Um, so the things that you would want to ask is, is the college accredited and is the program accredited? So colleges uh, tend to be regionally accredited. Like again, in the state of Texas, the Southern Association of Colleges is the most common that I've seen uh, for college accreditation. But for program accreditation, there's only one, and that's the Joint Review Commission on Education and Radiologic Technology. And we're going to take a look at their website here in just a minute. Find out what the costs are. Um, one of the benefits of college-based education is that there are scholarships available, a lot of financial aid available. Uh, veterans benefits are, are pretty uh, pretty common. If you are moving from a distance, then housing may be a consideration for you as well. Uh, housing for uh, community colleges is pretty rare uh, for uh, much housing. Uh, so check and see if there's there are any dorms available. Uh, some of your colleges, even community colleges, have uh, a lot of housing, but it's, it's relatively rare. So accreditation, I already talked about that. That's uh, college and program programmatic uh, accreditation. And I'm going to show you the uh, JRCERT website. And when I refer to the Joint Review Commission on Education Radiologic Technology, I'm going to call it one of two things, either the JRC or JSERT, just to, to abbreviate it and make it a little less cumbersome to, to, to uh, discuss. So I'm going to uh, see if I can share their website so that, so that you can see it a little bit better. Here we go. 
Here we go. JRCERT.org. If you go to JRCERT.org, you'll land on this page. This is our homepage. And it's a very friendly, uh, user-friendly web page. If you go to students, then you've got a, a number of different things that you can look up on the, the JRCERT website. So accreditation for students. Um, if you don't know if there's a program in your area for radiologic technology, this is a good place to go to find out. So if you click on find a program, what you'll get is this interactive map. Now, notice that anywhere I hover over, you will find um, that it changes colors. So if I click on any state, now I'm clicking on Texas here, then it's, it's going to populate all of the programs available in that state. So in the state of Texas, there are a lot of different options. So you've got uh, three pages, it says. It's really just over two pages. Um, so two pages and two, two more uh, programs. So I'm not going to try to promote any particular college in this presentation, I'm just going to say that what you can do is you can go to those um, any one of those programs, and if you click on one of the, the the links, then it will open up to the JRC uh, their website for that particular program. It's not going to take you to the program itself, but you can access the program from the page that it redirects you to. So if you click on one of those, then it'll take you to the JRC um, page for that program. And what you can glean from that is what their accreditation status is, how successful they, that program was on their last accreditation. You can find out some specific information about uh, the effectiveness of the program from a student standpoint, uh, how many students they graduate, how many students um, they accept into a program. You can get the, the uh, contact information from the program. So you can get a lot of different information. I'm going to show, show you some things that, that uh, programs that are accredited by the JRCERT um, have to, to have available on their program website at their institution. So um, what you're going to look for at the JRCERT website is a accreditation status. You can look at their accreditation letter and find out the last time that they went through the, the accreditation process, uh, what they got cited for. And a citation doesn't necessarily mean the program is bad. It's just uh, what the, the JRC tells the program that they need to do better. So uh, you can find that. You can find the, the program website. You can find the, the program statistics that we'll take a look at here in just a minute. So uh, with accreditation, I, I want to be clear about something. Uh, accreditation does not necessarily mean uh, a program being accredited does not necessarily mean the program is of high quality. Also, not being accredited does not automatically mean that the program is of low quality. It's just a, a measurement or it's a what accreditation is, is outside agency taking a look at a program to make sure that the program has the the tools and material in place to make sure the students can be successful. Um, so that's what accreditation is, and it, it doesn't ensure quality, but it is a measure, being accredited is a measure of whether or not the, the program is trying to, to make sure that they have all those tools in place. From a personal standpoint, I've never seen a program that was unaccredited that was top quality. And I've also never seen a, a program that was accredited that was the lowest quality. So uh, with that in mind, even though I say that, that accreditation doesn't always guarantee quality, it is a, a measure that uh, would indicate that there's some quality there, or at least some effort to, to be a, a quality program. So now that I stumbled through that, I want to show you a couple of different things. I'm going to unshare this. No. And I want to share a couple of documents that the, 
the JRC requires us to uh, have available or if not have available to abide by in our accreditation. So the first would be the program effectiveness data. Uh, so every program that is accredited by JRCERT is required to have this tool available on their program website. So this is program effectiveness data. This is a fictitious college. It's Teach, teach at Wright College, uh, master's degree program in radiography. So uh, what you can get from this is the credentialing examination pass rate. And that's, a, again, the American Registry of Radiologic Technologists. So what we see from this fictional college is that they've got five years of data compiled and presented in this document. This specific document has to be on the program website. So year one, they had 18 students that passed the examination out of 20 students who took it. So they graduated 20 students and 18 took it and or tw all 20 of them took the exam and 18 passed it. So they had a 90% pass rate. So their five year program average was 94.6 as first time testers on the ART exam. The second thing that we want to look at is job placement. So in that same year, they had uh, 19 people actually looking for a job that one other person might have been. Uh, maybe they were trying to get a, a doctorate and they went back to school or for whatever reason, they weren't looking for a job. So this is people who were actually looking for a job and were employed in a 12 month period. So in this case, they had. Uh, 19 people looking for a job out of those 20 people who graduated from the program, 17 of which got a job. So their their placement rate was uh, 89 percent. And then finally, we get to program completion rate. That same. Well, in 2022, they accepted uh, 22 students and they graduated 20 students. So if you go back up here in 2022, you see that they've got 21 that may mean a, a that may mean a student from the year before came back and completed the year after. So uh, those are the minimum requirements uh, for program effectiveness that that have to be found on the program website. But accreditation also requires certain things to also be posted: mission, goals, uh, student learning outcomes, what it is the program is looking at to ensure that the students um, the the students that are graduating have a measurable outcome for quality. Um, and those are usually set by an advisory committee or uh, with input from um, communities of interest is what, what we call it. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to show you a different page. And this is also something that programs are required to follow. You won't find this on the program website, but this is the extensive, this just shows you how extensive the JRC um, requirements are for a web page. So what we have to do during the, the accreditation process is make sure that the students can, can come to our website and evaluate their options as best they can. So we have to have our admissions transfer of credit policies posted, tuition and fees, graduation requirements, and it doesn't necessarily have to be on the program website, but it has to be accessible through the institutional website, a college website, graduation requirements, grading system. Um, our grading systems in our healthcare fields tend to, to have a, a higher uh, requirement for passing grades, uh, where most of your college classes, you have to have a 70 to, to complete the class. Um, most of your, your radiography programs or healthcare programs are going to be 75 to 82 minimum grades. So mission statement, goals, student learning outcomes, accreditation status, articulation agreements, calendar, and just a number of different things. I'm just going to scroll through this. I'm not going to read it all. So um, all of these things have to be um, available to students to assess the program to see whether or not they think that the program is, is for them. Going to stop sharing that and try to get back to the PowerPoint. There we go. 
All right, so once you've nar narrowed your search, what you want to do is you want to visit the program website, look for the application, look for anything that, that might answer the questions that you might have. Specifically, most um, the easiest thing that, that you would find to look at would be your, your FAQ documents. So if the program has received a number of, of uh, questions, similar questions, they may develop a, an FAQ or frequently asked question document to place on the program website to answer the questions that you, you might have uh, before you call the program. So look at the program application. Program application may have some uh, some information on requirements for application, but the FAQ should as well. Uh, what are the, the technical standards or the essential functions? What is it that you have to, to be able to accomplish to do the job? Most of your, your allied health and nursing programs are going to have something like that. Like, for example, if you have a, a, uh, an issue with your back and you can't lift and, and move things very well, healthcare is probably not a good place for you. And the reason for that is because it, it can be very physical. Moving uh, heavy equipment uh, requires a, a certain degree of health. And sometimes if you have a bad back or, or something like that, it may be very difficult for you uh, to, uh, to participate in clinicals and then to be successful in the career. So again, on the program website, what you're going to look for is the curriculum, look for prerequisite classes, prerequisite testing, and general education classes. Um, so there's, in a lot of cases, are some confusion between prerequisite classes and general education classes. General education classes are the classes that you have to, to have to complete the program and to earn your degree. Whereas a prerequisite class is a class that you have to have before you get to something else. So an application, a pre prerequisite class would be a class that you have to have before you can enroll in the program. So uh, general education classes, other prerequisite obligations like job shadowing um, and uh, something else that you need to look into if you're intended to apply to a program is that most of your programs are going to uh, require drug testing and a background check, criminal background check. And if you have a, a criminal background issue, it does not necessarily mean that you can't apply to the program. Uh, some of your programs are going to have requirements. So um, that require, one of those requirements may be to complete an ARRT, that's American Registry of Reg Radiologic Technologists, Ethics pre-application. You would go to ARRT.org and do a search for ethics pre-application and complete the pre-application and uh, have a determination before the application period ends. So what the pre-application is, is your opportunity to tell the ARRT what your criminal background is, and they evaluate and determine whether or not you will be able to take the ARRT exam after you graduate. So that may be a pre prerequisite obligation. Uh, find out what the application requirements are. Uh, keep up with important dates. There may be meetings that you have to attend before the application period is over. There may be interviews that you have to sign up for. There may be meetings after the application period ends. So keep up with the important dates. Call an academic advisor. Find out about the transferability of classes. Your program may not know if your uh, if your classes will that from other institutions will satisfy the requirements of the classes at your in, the institution that offers program. So you might have to call an academic advisor. That might need to be your first step before you call the, the program itself. And then finally, after you've read through all the program information, you've talked to an academic advisor, call the department if there's anything that's, that's left unanswered. Now, the reason I put that all the way at the bottom is because uh, most of your Radiography programs are, uh, there's limited faculty and limited staff. Um, and one staff tech may service multiple programs. Uh, so if you call the department, you talk to the staff tech, uh, if students or applicants for multiple programs call that staff tech, they're going to be overloaded with, with phone calls. If, uh, if you call the, the department director, um, directly, you'll probably get your, your question answered, but you got to remember that, that the program director is also a faculty in the program as well. 
Most of your small programs like that don't have a dedicated department chair. They have a department chair who also teaches classes. So uh, try to try to gain the information before you, you make the phone call. So JRC ERT requirements, we already talked about all that. So the different types of programs from an admission standpoint will be three different types of programs. So you have open enrollment programs. You have programs that may be open enrollment that have a wait list, and then you have selective admissions programs, and that's probably the most common. So an open enrollment program will be first come, first come, first serve. And if they don't have a wait list, that means every application period is unique. So every application period, you would be competing with all the other applicants. So if they have a wait list, what that would mean is that the second year that you apply to the program, then you should be bumped uh, down on the wait list so that your chances improve. And then selective admissions programs are programs that uh, have a separate application for the program itself. So you apply to the college and you apply to the program itself. And uh, there are certain things that you can do in, the, in those types of programs that you can increase your chances of, of being accepted into the program. That's what we're going to focus on mostly. So it's got an application process and it's merit based, which means that certain things that you do improve your chances of, of being accepted into the program. So test scores, your uh, the program is probably going to require some sort of entrance test like the HESI test or the ACT or the SAT or the Hobbit as H-O-B-E-T, I believe. So the Hobbit test, uh, pretty common. The HESI test is, is very common as well. So they're going to look at GPA. What is your overall GPA? Um, and there's probably going to be a minimum GPA required to apply to the program. Now, a few years ago, uh, we saw a trend in in uh, in colleges where students graduated from high school, went straight to college and didn't do well. And then they took some time off. And after a few years, it went back to college and did really, really well. So a lot of your colleges have what they refer to as a grade forgiveness program. So if you happen to be an applicant or you're seeking to be an applicant in a program and your GPA is very low because of classes that you took 10 years ago, don't be discouraged. Find out if they have a grade forgiveness program. Some of your programs themselves will also have a grade forgiveness program. So grades in specific classes, not necessarily the same thing as GPA. GPA takes all of your classes and takes a, takes a look at your average in all of those classes, as opposed to grades in specific classes matter as well. So let's say your biology classes, you scored a, a B in um, and a B let's say is prereq the the biology class is prerequisite class and you scored a B that's going to go into your grades but it's also going to go to, into your GPA so a B is a, a 3.0 an A is 4.0 let's say your your overall GPA is 3.5 then uh, your GPA and your grades in specific classes are not going to be the same and then finally some of your programs going to have an interview so the interview uh some trends that we see sometimes in the interview process is that students don't treat or applicants don't treat the interview as a professional interview. Treat it as a professional interview. If you don't know what that looks like or, or what that means, you probably ought to do a little bit of research on that. Uh, interview questions. Uh, you can't really search and, and find out exactly what a, a program is going to ask, but you can prepare yourself for a, an interview and see what it means to be professional in your interview. So keep up with the selection timeline. Most of your, your program is going to have a selection or a, an application deadline, and then you need to keep up with those important meeting dates that I talked about before. There may be, uh, they refer to some of those, those uh, meeting dates as information sessions, orientation dates. And if you're selected, let's say you make it all the way through the process and, and you're selected to be in the program, uh, especially on a selective admissions program, you need to respond to the program uh, and accept the position in the program. So that's your required response. So let's say you make it through the, the application period, you're selected for an interview, and then you receive a, a packet of information that, that asks the, it, for a response back. Make sure that you, you, um, Take time to make that response. Try to make it as soon as possible. 
try to follow the instructions in the, the application itself and try to get that, that response back to them as soon as possible. The, the importance of that is that if a program is, is looking to accept 30 students and you don't uh, respond, you're accepted in the program, you don't respond, they're going to pass your seat on to the next person. So you got to make sure that you respond to the, uh, the acceptance. All right, so timing of uh, or complicating issues, you got timing of testing, timing of prerequisite classes. You got to make sure that those classes and those tests are taken early enough that they're they're going to be available to the program uh, within the period of time that they need to be available. So if you are taking your prerequisite class and the class ends after the application period is over, you might not qualify for that year of um, that application year. So transferability of similar classes, um, especially if they're prerequisites classes, you want to make sure that you, you talk to a, an academic advisor and try to assess whether or not those classes will work. And if, they're, if they don't, then you might want to see if you can take some classes that would satisfy the requirement. Uh, criminal record, I already talked about. That's at ARRT.org. Um, and then just do the ethics pre-application, try to get that in as soon as possible. The timeline, the turnaround for that is is a couple of months. So you, you want to make sure that you get that done and completed before the application period is over as well. So what if you're not selected into the program? So there's one of two possibilities. You're either not selected because you weren't high enough to score uh, enough points to get you a, an interview, or possibly you did get an interview, but you didn't get selected into the program. So we're going to address both of those individually. First thing you need to know is it's not personal. The program is trying to select students that they believe through experience are going to be most uh, likely to be successful. So our job as faculty is to try to, to provide a workforce for the local community. And, uh, so the selection is, can the student make it through the classes? Can the student make it through clinicals? Um, can the student function in a professional manner? It's basically the three different aspects that we're looking for. So keep in mind, it's not personal. Um, it's selective admissions uh, and waitlisted and open enrollment programs can be a little bit different, but we're going to talk about the selective admissions. So go back and review the program policies and admission requirements. Maybe you skipped a step. Maybe you didn't turn something in on time, something like that. Um, the the admission requirements are set by the advisory committee and not necessarily by the program itself. So even in the program, um, we've, we've got some control, but we take input from our advisory committee. And what an advisory committee is, is a, a group of professionals from the community who tell us what it is that they're looking for in a student and eventually in an employee. So usually the department heads at, at the local hospitals. Um, some of your programs are going to have admissions committees. So after it goes through all these steps of, of application, it'll go to the admissions committee who actually selects the individual students. And uh, certainly there's a, a program integrity. Your program wants to select the students who are most likely to make it through the program. And um, the, the um, program and so be supported by the, the program effectiveness um measures that, that we looked at before. So um, also, though, your program is, is will want to um, follow their, their policies and procedures and admission requirements to make sure that they're above board. It's just not personal. It's, it's just a matter of, of trying to select the, the students who are most likely to be successful. So what might have influenced the decision? Again, re re review the application process. Um, what tasks um, could you have taken to, to uh, in increase your chances? Can your pre-entrance test scores improve? How did your interview go? Would be the things that you would, would need to ask yourself. So what tasks might uh, you have done differently? Uh, if you've got C's across the board in, in your prerequisite classes and those classes go towards your GPA, in those individual classes and they score those, those GPAs, that's going to matter in your application. Uh, again, some of your 
programs and colleges will have not just the grade forgiveness, but grade replacement policies. So that if you took A&P, your biology class, um, that A&P is anatomy and physiology. If you took that class and you scored a C and you just recognized that you didn't give it your best effort and you could take it again and make an A, then a lot of your programs will replace that C grade with an A grade and immediately your scores come up. So those types of things are things that, that you could consider. So uh, also things to consider is your dedication to that particular program. Should you apply to a different college? And if the answer to that is, is yes, then again, you, you need to go back to the selection process, uh, find you a quality program with evidence that you've got a quality program there. Um, again, if, if you're looking at a program that's not accredited and they don't have their, their program uh, effectiveness data posted, you have to wonder why. So consider your de dedication to the field too. Do you want to reapply to that college? Do you want to reapply to a different college? Um, and uh, can you apply to multiple programs? And most of your colleges, the answer to, to that question is yes. And in our particular program, we have students that apply to uh, radiology and to sonography. This is most common too. Um, so you can take a kind of a shotgun approach and apply to multiple programs. And then if you get it selected into, into multiple programs, you have one to select from. So uh, the, you need to review the requirements to start. Uh, you need to understand that most of the time your tuition and fees and books and uniforms and, and all that stuff in your first semester are going to be quite high. So you need to be prepared for that financially. You need to be prepared prepared for that, be it through uh, grants or scholarships or financial aid of some sort. So tuition, uh, evaluate tuition, evaluate your fees. There are going to be fees for lab. There's going to be fees for uh, equipment that you have to have, like uh, um, a TLD is a, a radiation detector that we have to wear as radiologic technologists. So you'll have to pay for that every semester. Uh, books usually quite high uniforms are going to be specific to the program. Uh, what kind of uniforms do you need? Equipment that you might need might include calculators, um, watches, good shoes. Uh, consider that you're going to have to take immunizations. Some of the immunizations you may be able to opt out of, but some are required by the state. So you have to have them. Uh, transportation. What are the transportation requirements? Every program that I'm familiar with, there are some transportation requirements. If, if you have an unreliable car, you might want to address that before you accept a position in the program. So once accepted in the program, um, to be successful in your didactic classes, it can't be stressed enough that you need to get in front of those classes. Uh, you need to... Um, um, prepare for the classes before the classes start. What I mean by that is read ahead, uh, form study groups, dedicate the time to study. So there's a formula that's, that's been around for forever. And that is that for every class, every hour in class, you need to dedicate one, I'm sorry, you need to dedicate two to three hours of study outside of class. So read ahead, perform or form professional habits for clinical uh, education as well. What do you think professionalism looks like? If you can think of somebody who you've always looked up to and thought, you know, this person's really got it together in their career field, um, that's somebody that you might want to model your own professional habits off of. So uh, that's really more of a clinical issue, but um, it also applies to the classroom as well. Remember, all of your programs are, are trying to accept students into the program that can graduate from the program. There's not a program out there, a faculty member out there that's trying to fail you out of classes. They're trying to make you successful. Um, not all of your programs are going to be easy. Not all of your instructors or professors are going to be uh, easy. But all your professors want you to look a certain way, not physically, but professionally, by the time you graduate. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to pull the best out of you to make you into that person. So uh, if you get into to a program, uh, dedicate your time to it. Most of the time that we have somebody who's unsuccessful in class, 
whenever they come back in a, in a subsequent year, we ask them, what, what was the problem? You know, what, what are you going to do different this, this time around? And their answer almost universally is I'm going to dedicate the, the time to it that needs to be dedicated to it. So it's just a matter of timing. Um, so most of your, your classes, uh, you can complete the class. If you get into the program, you can complete the class if you give it enough effort. But that's the key. You have to give it the effort. So I hope this was helpful. This was application to, to uh, healthcare programs from a faculty standpoint. I know there's a lot of videos out there on, on application from a student standpoint, but this is application from a faculty standpoint. And I hope this, uh, this helps 